directed by Brian Redhead. At 11 o'clock in the morning on Sunday, September the 3rd, 1939, the Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain told the nation that we were at war. At half past seven that very same evening, the Battle of the Atlantic began. The Battle of the Atlantic lasted for almost the whole of the Second World War, but 50 years ago today, on May the 31st, 1943, the Allies knew that the battle had been won. And these last six days, here in Liverpool, that victory has been remembered and commemorated. Not only are there ships, warships and merchant ships from all over the world here on the Mersey, but there are also seamen, many of whom were last here 50 years ago. It is a reunion and the local people love it. Everybody who has come has been made to feel very welcome. On Wednesday, His Royal Highness the Duke of Edinburgh reviewed the fleet of Royal Navy, Merchant Navy and Foreign and Commonwealth ships in a Force 9 gale. On Friday, Her Majesty the Queen came here to meet some of the veterans and to confirm that the Merseyside Maritime Museum is complete. On Saturday, the old boys marched through Liverpool, accompanied by a thousand sailors and no fewer than eight bands and countless happy onlookers. And that afternoon, the Royal Air Force and the Royal Navy staged a fly-past of aircraft old and new. And yesterday, in the Anglican Cathedral, the Prince and the Princess of Wales and the Prime Minister attended the official service of commemoration with the veterans. This last week has been a time for reflection and a time for remembering fallen comrades and lost ships. Empire Sun, Shantung, Baron Erskine, Cyclops, Caledonian Monarch, Empire Parsons, Frisco, Ingrid, Lady Hawkins, City of Atlanta, Alexandra Hull, William Hansen, Olympic, Athol Crown. With some of Britain's most modern ships in port, most of the veterans have been aboard them, but that too revived old memories. People say certain things. I meet people and they say certain uh, something to me and it all brings back a memory of something else. It's all uh, nostalgia in some ways. I came into Liverpool 50 years ago this year and went to Birkenhead Graving Dock and we changed our screws there. So we were only here for 36 hours. So Liverpool I didn't know much about but all I know it was very, very busy while we were here. Here at the Veterans Centre on the pier head, many took the opportunity to meet old comrades. Some of them had not seen each other for 50 years. But one thing which has not changed over the years is the comradeship among ships' companies and the interest in matters maritime. It's nice to see all the old faces. These photographs were taken in 1942, aboard the Romney, when Winston Churchill and Sir Stafford Cripps came to congratulate the crew on sinking the bin, Mark. It's a long time ago now, isn't it? <laughs> we'll not be here for the next one. Well, 50. we've done our best to get you interested. I'm glad you came. The 
first ship to be sunk in the Battle of the Atlantic on September the 3rd, 1939, had set sail from Liverpool the day before. It was the passenger liner Athenia, and she was sunk by a U-boat with the loss of 112 lives. The loss of life in the one in five merchant seamen died. In fact, more men in the merchant navy died in the war than in the Royal Navy, the Royal Air Force, or the Army. But it was the price of keeping the supply lines open. Churchill said that the only thing that ever really frightened him during the war was the U-boat peril. During the phony war until the early 1940s, Atlantic operations were controlled from Plymouth, but Plymouth was being heavily bombed, and Churchill ordered a move to the port of Liverpool, a very sensible choice, because Liverpool was not only a flourishing port, it was the very heart of the Atlantic shipping organisation, and what is more, it was well away from the invasion-threatened south coast. It was to here in this basement deep underground in Derby House, Liverpool, in a cellar reinforced to withstand a direct hit from a 500-pound bomb that Admiral Sir Percy Noble and his commanders moved to direct the operations of the convoys and also to direct their defence. And on February the 7th, 1941, Liverpool became headquarters Western Approaches. And that was a double first. It was the first headquarters of a combined operation involving the activities not only of the Royal Navy but of RAF Coastal Command and it was the first headquarters of the international operation in the Battle of the Atlantic. The Allies came in, first the Canadians followed by the Americans. Number 15 Group RAF Coastal Command made its headquarters here alongside the Royal Navy. Air Vice Marshal J.M. Robb was in charge of Coastal Command here in 1941 with 11 squadrons, all based down the west coast. This room was top secret. Sworn to silence, the Wrens working here would keep the maps and charts up to date, synchronised minute by minute over open telephone lines with those in the Admiralty in London. Churchill used the information to direct the policy of the Atlantic War from the underground cabinet war rooms. Ships were plotted, the convoys were uh, arranged, and uh, a situation report was uh, made out daily, which named the number of the convoy, the names of the ships uh, that were in that convoy, um, the destination and where they rendezvoused with other ships. You're very aware that um, if you did speak out of turn at all, then lives could be lost. It, it really was very important and we really were aware of the fact that you just didn't speak about the work that, uh, that you were doing. You didn't divulge any information to anyone. 21 months later, Admiral Sir Max Horton took command for the rest of the war. Now, he was a character. He'd been a submariner in the First World War and was the first person ever to sink a ship from a submarine. Horton had a hotline to Churchill. He used to ring him every day. Now, Horton was a difficult man, but he and Churchill got on famously, and so they discussed not only tactics, but the whole strategy of the battle. Derby House contained the most modern equipment of the day and was part of a vast intelligence gathering network embracing Russia and Iceland, America and the West Indies, West Africa and the Azores. This headquarters commanded all Allied sea and air warfare over 12 million square miles of the Atlantic, from south of the equator right up to the Arctic Circle and of course the convoys to Murmansk. The simple truth is that during the war, Liverpool was the working headquarters of the Royal Navy. After the war, Admiral Sir Max Horton was honored not only by this country, but by France, Russia, Holland, Norway, and the United States. And when he died, he was given a state funeral in Liverpool. 
and is remembered by a plaque in the Anglican Cathedral. Derby House also contained the world's first anti-submarine warfare school. 5,000 officers from sub-lieutenants to admirals passed through the school learning how to defeat U-boats with modern weapons. Among them, sub-lieutenant Philip Mountbatten, RN. Last Wednesday, 50 years later, His Royal Highness Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, aboard the Royal Yacht Britannia in stormy seas, reviewed a fleet of 33 Royal Naval, Commonwealth and International ships anchored off the coast of Anglesey. In a force eight gale gusting to force nine, almost everybody else stayed at home. There were scarcely any onlookers, but then the visibility was poor. It was not a day for casual ship spotting. But the press corps were there, seasick on the crest of a wave aboard HMS Bulldog. This was indeed Atlantic convoy weather, but then the merchant seamen recalled that they always welcomed such weather during the war because it kept the U-boats deep underwater. And the RAF were above it all. His Royal Highness was not abashed, although by the end of the review the wind had torn his standard to shreds. His principal guest was King Harald of Norway, so the proceedings began with a 21-gun salute and with a fly past. HMS Cornwall, a Type 22 frigate, was the flagship of the fleet, and she was taking the place of the Ark Royal, who was on duty in the Adriatic at present. Anti-submarine Nimrods from RAF Kinloss flew over. They were followed over the anchored fleet by Sea King and Lynx anti-submarine helicopters of the Royal Navy. We could have done with them in the 1940s. The Royal Yacht then sailed along the lines of the anchored ships. King Harold was in the uniform of an honorary colonel of the Royal Marines. The crew of the United States ship Deo, an American anti-submarine destroyer, manned the side as Britannia passed. Deo too was standing in for a sister ship, the Moosebrugge. Indeed, eight vessels from members of the NATO Standing Naval Force Atlantic who had hoped to be here have gone to the Adriatic. His Royal Highness acknowledged the cheers of the New Zealand support ship Endeavour. She had come 13,000 miles to be here. The Russian destroyer, Grem Yasha, was here to say thank you for the convoys to Murmansk. It appeared to be one of the most powerfully armed warships on display. And the royal party was also much taken by the Brazilian anti-submarine frigate, Defensora. She was built in Britain 20 years ago. Next came the Canadian Annapolis-class anti-submarine frigate Nipigon. The Canadian contribution to the Battle of the Atlantic cannot be overpraised. 
By May 1941, convoys were met in mid-Atlantic by the Royal Canadian Navy ships and then escorted into Newfoundland and Montreal. Liverpool, not the port but the ship, was Britannia's next port of call. And the crew were of one voice, in triplicate. In Moilfree Bay, Anglesey, unsheltered from the northeast wind, as Britannia turned to inspect another line of ships, her escort, HMS Active, followed her. In this sea, hyperactive. Shining white in the grey water, the US Coast Guard cutter Galantine, itself another powerful anti-submarine vessel, also greeted His Royal Highness. The high waves were too much for most of the small craft who sought calmer waters, but the minesweeper HMS Humber, manned by Royal Naval Reservists, stayed on station, as the men did in the war. Four out of every five sailors in the Battle of the Atlantic had been called up from the Royal Naval Reservists. Their task? To protect the merchant fleet. We had two torpedoes fired into us. Fortunately, the cargo didn't catch fire, so we were able to lower the lifeboats, get into the lifeboats and pull away. But my memories were of sitting in the lifeboat and how pregnant it seemed to see our ship going down the cargo going that we'd struggle to bring across. Our personal belongings were going down as well. And then there was the final bang when the cool seawater hit the boilers. A rather very sad time. Eight hundred veterans of the Battle of the Atlantic were following the Royal Yacht in the Sea Link ferry Stena Cambria. There were a few other merchant ships in the review and many comments that we could do with a bigger British merchant fleet now. At the end of the review, Britannia and the other vessels of the fleet set sail for Liverpool. In the early hours of Thursday morning, the first ship to arrive in Liverpool was the flagship HMS Cornwall, a silhouette in the early light as she took up her moorings in the Mersey opposite the Albert Dock. It was raining. Other ships in the fleet followed HMS Cornwall up the Mersey and berthed in docks on both sides of the river, in Liverpool and in Birkenhead. It was a grey dawn, but imagine what it would have been like in the blackout. And HMS Cornwall certainly looked at home, moored in front of the Liver building. It was already daylight when the Royal Yacht Britannia arrived at the pier head, but it was still raining.
the recent visit of the tall ships reminded Liverpool and the world of the port's history. In the 19th century, it shipped emigrants to the New World and export to the whole world. The famous buildings of the city are not only symbols of its achievements, but evidence that it is still a flourishing and a profitable port. The port has moved downstream and upriver from the pierhead, four miles of dockland is being redeveloped. Famous docks with famous names, Nelson, Huskisson, Wellington, Gladstone and Albert Dock. Now the site, among other things, of the new Merseyside Maritime Museum. A Royal Naval Guard of Honour of 96 officers and men with the Queen's colour, the white ensign, greeted Her Majesty the Queen when she arrived here in Liverpool on Friday morning. The Guard was under the command of Lieutenant Commander Hawley. Her Majesty and the Duke of Edinburgh also met 40 veterans of the Battle of the Atlantic. Among them, two VCs and two survivors from the First World War, one aged 98 and the other 102. They also talked to local people in the crowd, many of them veterans too. The chairman of the National Museums and Galleries of Merseyside, Sir Leslie Young, then invited Her Majesty into the museum, and eight-year-old Helen Hope presented the Queen with a bouquet, and she told her that she was dressed in the manner of girls of 1854 in Liverpool. But once inside, the Queen unveiled a plaque to mark the completion of the Merseyside Maritime Museum. Her Majesty saw the newest permanent gallery in the Maritime Museum, which is called the Battle of the Atlantic. It was created by Dr. Alan Scarth and his team, and it tells the whole story. The first thing you learn when you come into this gallery is how much we owe to the Merchant Navy. They made literally thousands of Atlantic crossings, and at first they had little or no armament to protect them. A ship was lucky if it had a single gun like this. And remember that the Germans had U-boats and battleships and magnetic mines. And magnetic mines were a particular hazard because a ship would cross the Atlantic, feel that it was almost safely home, and then a new hazard. We pulled into Newcastle because we were going down the coast to London to Perfleece with the cargo of oil, you see. And the, uh, they brought about 200 sailors come aboard carrying about four inches of a uh, copper wire and he degaussed the ship you know made it so for these magnetic man you see and we went down got down to london and sailing up the sand and the ship in front of us took a mine and uh, she was burning for about four days the germans had fast new battleships with superior firepower and their presence in the Atlantic not only threatened the supply lines, but also diverted the Royal Navy from defending the convoys, because they had to chase those new battleships. And indeed, they sank the Bismarck and the Tirpitz. And then there were the U-boats, the most serious threat of all to our merchant shipping. By June 1940, the German U-boats had already sunk 200 ships in the Atlantic. And the men who commanded them, men like Kreschmer and his colleagues, were great German folk heroes. Hitler built no fewer than a thousand U-boats, though fortunately in the end we sank more than half of them. But if you come here, and you look in this periscope, you can see exactly what the U-boat commanders saw when they were attacking our convoys. You could get a fix on their radio transmission, and uh, of course the shore stations also got a fix, and we'd get the signal saying, uh, you know, a <coughs> U-boat has reported your convoy, so what you knew then you had to come to a, a higher state of readiness uh, from uh, cruising stations. And uh, then, of course, that first one uh, would home others in, and gradually the pack would gather, and uh, then the fun started. Or in the early days, uh, say 1942, 41, 42, uh, there were only five and six in a pack. They didn't have so many. Um, later on, 
43, late at the end of 42, 43, there were 20 in a pack. In fact, one of my worst moments was receiving the signal from uh, Liverpool. Um, there are 40 U-boats in contact with your convoy. The stomach hit the deck. In fact, there's only 39 made contact. One, one, didn't, uh, one got lost and didn't find us, but still, um, 39 was quite enough to handle. Britain needed to import food, ammunition, and above all, fuel, oil, if we were to survive and fight the war. It was absolutely essential to keep that Atlantic supply line open. It really was a matter of life or death. There was a moment in the darkest days of the war when we only had enough oil for the Navy for 30 days. And remember, the Germans were sinking our merchant ships far faster than we could replace them. At first, we only had primitive forms of sonar like ASDIC to detect the U-boats. With this set, you could only see where they were coming from, not how deep they were. Eventually, the tide turned. There were more ships, more planes, and science provided newer and more effective equipment. Better radar, which enabled the ships and the planes to identify a surface submarine at seven and a half miles and a periscope at 3,000 yards. High frequency direction finding allowed an escort ship to pinpoint a U-boat radioing home and new kinds of anti-submarine mortars, such as Hedgehog, which fired a spread of bombs in an arc in front of the escort ship. And we also began to know what the Germans were up to in the Atlantic, because the Poles had cracked the Enigma code by which the Germans sent messages to their navy, and the Allies were now able to pinpoint the movements of all the German warships and U-boats. One of Liverpool's great heroes was Captain F.J. Walker, Johnny Walker, who commanded an escort group from his destroyer HMS Starling, and he devised the best tactic of the war for killing U-boats. He called it the Hunter Killer, and he would say, a hunting we will go. He had a, a, a knack, Walker. He was uncanny with his... Uh, there must have been some kind of... Um, format laid down which the German uh, officers and the British officers had given any, any given circumstance and Walker would say now the textbook would tell this fellow to do this or that but he's going to be smart this fellow and he's not going to do this or that he's going to do the other so we will do the other and it paid off he was a marvellous tactician apart from now he was a lovely man he did all he could to help you Johnny Walker sank 26 U-boats, two on one morning or so they say, and when he returned to Bootle from his Atlantic adventures, thousands turned out to welcome him home. A lot of the wrens went down to those who perhaps were off duty, went, uh, went down to the pierhead to, to welcome him home, and he too was delighted with the reception, uh, so much so that he arranged a party for us with his wife, um, a dance and uh, a buffet meal. They said that he had the Nelson touch. His bravery, his tactics, and his ability to inspire his crews set him apart from other men, and he rapidly became a local and indeed a national hero. In July 1944, Johnny Walker was exhausted and he died of a stroke. In 1964, an association of his old boys was formed and they have met in Bootle regularly ever since. On Friday afternoon, they gathered in Bootle Town Hall to meet the Queen. On Saturday morning, they met again for their service of remembrance by the War Memorial in Bootle. The memorial is only a few hundred yards away from the dock from which Johnny Walker and his boys regularly sailed.
As early as 1940, Churchill had instructed RAF Coastal Command to cooperate with the Royal Navy to take care and protect the Atlantic convoys, and as he put it, to prevent them strangling our food supplies. And that cooperation was crucial. The Germans never achieved it. The German Navy and the German Air Force couldn't agree on anything. Perhaps their commanders disliked each other. But we, in a curious way, were relearning a lesson of the First World War, which is that one of the most effective ways of dealing with submarines is to use aircraft. I suddenly found a blip, and uh, I hove the aeroplane onto this blip. And it was a very, very clear blip. Suddenly went, and I thought, gosh, that, how could it, unless it was a submarine, and it, you know, submerged. So um, I said, right, uh, we'll go away for half an hour, which we did. And then we came back we, uh, uh, towards the same point, carefully up moon, so that one could see. And the blip came up again, and I got frankly excited. Oh, gosh, here we are. And we got closer and closer, the blip stayed there, and I got told the chap to get the boat lower and lower, so that we were ready to drop these depth charge things. And sure enough, there it was, a submarine on the surface. And so, from here, Derby House, RAF pilots went on mission after mission over the Atlantic. They flew no fewer than 786,928 flying hours. Every mission planned, plotted and controlled from here. It was perhaps with that in mind that almost a quarter of a million people lined both banks of the Mersey on Saturday afternoon and lifted up their eyes to witness a commemorative flying display. Both ancient and modern aircraft took part. 5C Harrier vertical takeoff jet fighters opened the show, illustrating the long tradition of navalized land aircraft serving with the fleet. They were followed by some sailors who'd come ashore, former Navy buccaneers now with the Royal Air Force. Also based ashore, but with eyes firmly fixed on the sea, three RAF Nimrods, the modern successors to Coastal Command's search and anti-submarine aircraft. We let off a smoke flare, you see, which drifted downwind. And as soon as the aircraft saw this, he turned round and came right down and flew. And we were very thankful to see that it was a Liberator bomber, actually. Well, he circled round, signalling to us. And uh, uh, then he dropped a bag, which burst as soon as it dropped. <laughs> he tried again, and we managed to retrieve that bag. And in it was a message which read something like this. A destroyer will be with you well before dark, about 1,600 hours. Best of luck, drop us a line when you got get back. And it was signed by every member of the crew. The modern equivalent of the wartime Liberator is probably the P-3 Orion. This one is from 333 Squadron Royal Norwegian Air Force. And then from the west flew in a real vintage bomber, an American Boeing B-17, a flying fortress, the first of the historic aircraft on display. Though an excellent bomber, the flying fortress lacked the range to be a truly effective coastal command aircraft. It could only fly 1,200 miles, but nonetheless the crowd loved seeing it. This, the Sally B, is a privately owned memorial aircraft, one of only two flying fortresses still flying in Europe. It is genuinely a vintage aircraft. Next came a Spitfire. A Supermarine Mark IIA Spitfire from the RAF's Battle of Britain flight. It was really representing the naval variant of the Spitfire, the Seafire, 
and more than 2,000 sea fires were built. Launched from flight decks and coastal airfields, they brought relief to many convoys harassed by the Luftwaffe's anti-shipping Condor bombers. This Spitfire was flown by squadron leader Chris Stevens, who was a former Lightning pilot. The Sea Fire had an arrestor hook for deck landings and folding wings to fit into an aircraft carrier's hangars. Its weakness was a very narrow undercarriage, which is something of a handicap when you're trying to land on a rolling ship. But the twin stars of the show were the two fairy swordfish wartime naval torpedo bombers. Known as the string bag and slow and out of date even at the start of the war, the swordfish was loved by its crews. There was a joy of the swordfish. You literally, uh, you could land so slowly when she was light. But, um, unless you hadn't been run straight into brick wall, you, even if you did, the engine went through the wall first and then you followed the through the hole. Unlike these modern jet aircraft, where you, go, you make the hole and the engine follows you. We thought that was very unsporting when we first had them. And that single engine, the Bristol Pegasus radial engine, kept the swordfish flying in theatres of war from the Arctic Circle to the equator. Although in that open cockpit, the three air crew usually preferred the equator. The consolidated PBY Catalina flying boat, developed pre-war by the Americans, came to be similarly loved by British Coastal Command. With a staggering range of 4,000 miles, the Catalina helped to close the gap of air cover over the Atlantic. Now for the present. Anti-submarine and rescue Sea Kings joined naval lynxes for a flypast, an air-sea rescue and an anti-submarine display. Will the pilot play his ace, I wonder? long wait on the wire is a dunking sonar sniffing out a submarine. But the two swordfish, the only two still flying in the world, said farewell. The seven miles of Liverpool docks were hugely busy during the war. They could service four convoys of 20 ships each, all at once. The 20,000 ship repairers were almost all over 50, because the younger men had all been called up. And because this was preeminently the Atlantic convoy port, the Germans bombed it mercilessly. In the Blitz in the first fortnight of May 1941, only one in four of the mooring bays was left working and more than 3,000 people were killed. But the people of Liverpool did not succumb to self-pity. They knew that they were a target precisely because of their crucial contribution to the war and they were determined to keep Britain going through those dark and difficult days. And not just this country. Every sailor coming up the Mersey is familiar with the sailors' church, the parish church of Liverpool. In thanksgiving for those who served our nation in the Second World War, and in particular remembrance of those who sailed in the Arctic convoys, we come to dedicate this place. 
In the faith of Jesus Christ, we dedicate this plot of ground to the glory of God, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. May the Lord of his great mercy watch over this great city of Liverpool. On Wednesday afternoon, a new chapel, the Maritime Chapel, was dedicated by the three church leaders. We acknowledge the great importance of the maritime community in Merseyside, both in past ages and in the present day, and the significance of this church within the port of Liverpool. It is therefore fitting that there should be a chapel set apart for seafarers and all who serve this port, and that it should be dedicated ecumenically. Peace be to this house, and to all who enter it. We dedicate this chapel in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. On Sunday morning, a fanfare greeted the arrival of the Prince and the Princess of Wales at the service of commemoration in the Anglican Cathedral. The standards borne aloft were the national flags of the ship's companies attending the service. The bound record of Western Approaches Command was laid upon the altar. Strange is the vigour in a brave man's soul, the strength of his spirit and his irresistible power, the greatness of his heart and the height of his condition, his mighty confidence and contempt of dangers. Those were at Max Horton's favourite words. The Prime Minister then read a lesson to a congregation which included over 2,000 veterans and Liverpool's three religious leaders, Bishop Shepherd, Archbishop Warlock and Dr John Newton, together as so often led the prayers of remembrance and the Archbishop of York gave the address. We proudly salute those who went before us. Despite the awful tragedies of today's world, we too can live and die in hope. The sea will give up its dead. Beyond the abyss lies the promise of new creation. The Red Ensign led the final procession because these last few days in Liverpool have not only been an act of remembrance but something to remember. On Saturday, the people turned out in their thousands for the march past of the veterans. They lined the processional route all the way from Man Island uphill to St George's Hall. The march past was led by the band of Her Majesty's Royal Marines, Portsmouth. The new Lord Mayor of Liverpool, Councillor Michael Black, took the salute in Derby Square. This little girl was only one among many eager to see everything. Behind the band of the Marines came contingents from HMS Liverpool, from 5-8 King's Regiment, from RAF Kinloss, from the Merchant Navy, from the Canadian Navy, from the Norwegian Navy. The parade was in six columns and the second column was led by the band of the Royal Marines Plymouth. Behind them came the first of the veterans, marching at the same pace and with the same precision as the serving troops. You could hear their medals clicking.
There were eight bands in the parade, a thousand sailors and three thousand veterans. Also in this column were the Royal Naval Reservists from HMS Eaglet. Their ship was flying the flag of the Commander-in-Chief of Naval Home Command and they commanded attention. Sailors from the South African ship, the Drakensberg, reminded everyone that South Africa was an ally during the war. The Royal Artillery Band heralded a second group of veterans. Many more had come to march than had been predicted, and many were marching alongside old comrades and shipmates whom they'd not seen for years, and they were overjoyed to be reunited. The veterans of the Arctic convoys were unmistakable in their white berries. Not far behind them was the North Fleet Soviet band, here to thank the men in the White Berries for bringing Russia its supplies during the war. No question of lowering standards here. All the standards were aloft. Symbols of achievements always to be saluted. And in the ranks of the veterans, men from Canada, from America, from Australia, heroes all. As this group arrived at St George's Hall, four more bands were still marching. Among them, the central band of the Royal Air Force. They too were followed by more standards and more veterans. All the men marching who had served in the Battle of the Atlantic, whether in the armed services or in the Merchant Navy, were the Atlantic Star. Marching with them were war widows and old dock workers, all united in the knowledge that at last, after 50 years, the country has fully acknowledged the debt we owe them. The Battle of the Atlantic was fought to save the nation from starvation. If we had lost that battle, as Churchill himself said, we would have lost the power to carry on the war and to save ourselves. It was in every sense a combined operation. The victory was accomplished by the cooperation of everyone involved, the armed forces, the merchant seamen, and the civilians themselves here back home. And you know, I believe that we won simply because we relied upon the skills and the endurance and the stubbornness of individual people. Thanks.